Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, I'm gonna fix a monitor. Well, more specifically, a television set, and it's this television set right here. So, without further ado, let's get right to it. If you're a regular viewer of my channel, you've probably seen this 20-inch Toshiba television set sitting here for a good number of years. It's been in this exact position because I really like to have a monitor sitting right here that has front inputs on it, is decent size, bright and vibrant, and really easy to use for any time I'm working on this little outcropping of a bench here. I kind of take it for granted that this thing is just here and it works and I have my VCR and a DVD player stacked on top of it so I can even watch television down here if I need to. But the other day I went to turn it on and uh, here's the power cord, it's unplugged. If I plug it in, we'll see what happens. Uh, last time I did this, the TV wouldn't turn on anymore. Now, maybe it has fixed itself miraculously, but I doubt it. So it's off right now. Oh, okay. It just, it's making a clicking sound. It is clicking on and off. So it's almost like it's trying to start, but uh, well, yeah, it's not starting. What's extra disappointing is that, well, the television is not very old. I don't remember the exact date. We'll see when we look at the back of it, but I think it was made in the very end of the 90s or possibly even in the 2000s, because as you see here, it's a flat screen and yet, it already broke and it, it hardly has any hours on it. I don't use it that much. And well, I found this on the street in the trash. It was, yeah, it was actually just left on the curb and it was raining as well when I found it, but I just dried it off and it was actually completely clean on the inside and out. And it's been, well, a good set ever since, but well, now it's just kind of given up the ghost. So I think it's time to uh, pull this out, get this stuff off the top of it. We'll take a closer look at, I don't know, the whole 360 of the TV and we'll open it up and hopefully I can get this thing fixed. All right, I got the set uh, away from the wall and the stuff off the top of it so we can spin it around. So as you can see, this is a flat CRT. I forgot what Toshiba called it, FST or something like that. Of course, Sony came up with this first. I think it was Sony that came up with this first on their CRTs to kind of like, you know, not look so outdated and old with that curved screen. I prefer the curvature of an older TV, especially like a Sony Trinitron with a cylindrical front. This one is fine, I guess. There's a few things about this that I really do like. Um, I don't love the, the gray color of it. I'd rather it just have been like the black color of the earlier TVs from the 90s. But the silver is unfortunately what you get when you have these uh, newer televisions. The thing that I like about this thing is it has the front firing speakers that actually sound pretty good. So I can hook up whatever I have hooked up to it and just use the internal speakers. And you know, it's not so bad sounding. Also convenient when we take a closer look at these front controls, there is actually a front input, although it doesn't have S-Video, it just has composite. I think there's like a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack there. We have a volume and a channel selector, the infrared receiver, and there is a power button here. One thing I kind of wish this had is an LED that might light up to indicate that the TV was on because this TV, when you turn it on and there's no input signal, it will say like input whatever on the screen for a little while and then that goes away and the picture is entirely black. And of course, since I'm a bit old now, I don't really hear the 15 kilohertz horizontal scan rate of the television any longer. So yeah, I've left this thing on for, I don't know, a few days at a time, uh, not realizing it because there's just no LED on the front at all. It was kind of amazing when I found this thing on the street that it was 100% blemish free. Uh, I actually caused that little dent in the front. I don't remember what I did, but I dropped something or I, you know, something fell over that was on the bench and it hit the TV right there and I put that little dent in the grill. Otherwise, we're just talking about a very late model CRT. Now, turning it around, we do have the Chicken Lips Commodore sticker here. Uh, there's a Rams head for, of course, Rammy. And then we have a Commodore 64 sticker, of course. Yeah, I put those on there because I don't know, why not? It is almost certain that I'll be the last owner of this television because, well, to be honest, it could be the end of the line right now, depending on what's wrong with it. 
Now, flipping it around, uh, one of the other things I like about this, of course, is that, well, you know, being a late model television, it's all plastic, so it's relatively light. But Toshiba went ahead and installed these two relatively convenient carry handles. Now, of course, the back of the set is light because it's just hollow plastic, and all the weight is in the front where the glass is. So you lift this here, and it will kind of push against your chest, and you can move this TV around without too much difficulty. They also put space underneath the case right here that makes it really easy to pick up. So compared to, say, I don't know, one of those broadcast monitors, which I happen to have a JVC 20-inch one, similar size to this, it weighs so much because it's got this big metal chassis and all these cards inside and stuff like that. Well, this thing's got pretty much nothing inside. It's just a CRT with a little circuit board. And well, like I said, hopefully we're gonna be able to take this apart and figure out what went wrong in here. And I'm sure already, just knowing that, you know, I was clicking, trying to turn on, everyone probably knows what's wrong with it. I mean, I do as well. Bad capacitors. Like this thing was made when the cat plague was happening. And it's just, it's kind of sad. I mean, look, we haven't even figured out what's wrong with this thing, but most likely it's gonna be the caps. I hope it is, because then it will work again once I fix them. But the sad thing is, like, I have so many monitors that are so much older than this that got used so much more, and of course they still work perfectly, while this thing barely was used, and it's already broken. Junk. Total junk. Okay, so the back label. Here it is. February 2001. So yeah, this thing is a very late model. And here's the model number, 20AF41. I'll make sure to put that in the description. Toshiba America Consumer Products, uh, made in Thailand. But uh, yeah, this was actually one Toshiba was a real company. Yes, I mean, I know they're still a real company, but to be honest, I think in the United States at least, if you go to a store and you buy a Toshiba flat panel, like an LCD TV or whatever, it is not a Toshiba anymore. It is made by, I think, a Chinese manufacturer, and they bought the name rights. It was nothing to do with the Japanese company Toshiba that had been making televisions and all sorts of other things for a very long time. This, on the other hand, was actually made, well, by the company Toshiba. Of course, it was made in Thailand, but nonetheless, yeah, Toshiba. Now, fortunately, it's a little hard for me to show the inputs on this set, but it's another reason why I really like this set. And when I found it, I was actually kind of excited because for a 20-inch set, they don't always have the full gamut of inputs on the back, but this one does. We have an RF input, we have an S-video input, there are two composite inputs. I think there's a composite output, probably like of the tuner or whatnot. And then we also have component input. Now people in Europe, I'm sure are gonna be going like, what's up with the fact there's no RGB and no SCART? Well, yeah, this is the United States and yeah, that was just not a thing. The component input is here specifically for hooking up to DVD players because it gives you RGB-like quality. It's not as good as RGB. Well, I mean, it probably is as good as RGB. It's just a different type of colorometry, I think it's called, or whatever. The way the color is transmitted to the TV is just different than RGB. It is still a differential component signal, and therefore it has excellent quality. This television is strictly an interlaced television, does not support any high definition resolutions, no 480p, nothing like that. It's strictly 15 kilohertz regular NTSC. So that component input is like a standard 240p or 480i input. And I actually have this little thing which I bought a while back and this is an RGB to component adapter or converter, I guess you want to say. Uh, yes, I ended up soldering on a power supply because I think this had a USB connector originally and that failed. Now, unfortunately, I cannot tell you where to buy this. I bought this a number of years ago and the seller, which was out of Australia or New Zealand, I don't remember. Well, they unfortunately do not sell this anymore. It wasn't very expensive. I think it was like $30 and it does awesome conversion from RGB through this VGA-like connector, but it is just standard uh, 15 kilohertz RGB to component. It looks fantastic and hooked up to this television set basically looks as good as it would if you had RGB on it. So really I have no complaints. Actually, I noticed on the back of this, it has the email address or the name of the person who made this. I'll try to see if that is readable in post. There's a date from 2018 as well, and RGB to YPBPR. Y being luminance, and then PB and PR is the two component color values for the red and blue. You may also notice there is a SCART footprint on here, because I think in Australia, it's also not common to get SCART televisions. They exist, they're just not super common. 
So this adapter is probably useful to Australians. Well, it would have been if you could still buy it because you could hook up SCART devices to it, like game consoles or whatever, and get a really high quality component output for hooking directly up to one of your televisions that only has component inputs, just like these North American televisions. And that's pretty much it for the outside of this television. At this point, I just need to take the cover off so we can start looking inside. Now, while I do this, of course, it goes without saying that opening up a television set is very dangerous, specifically because if you have it connected to mains and you have it turned on, there are lethal voltages inside of here. Obviously, the CRT itself operates at a pretty high voltage, especially a, a large one like this probably at 25,000 volts, something like that. And that can give you a pretty big wallop. So do not, I repeat, do not open a CRT unless you know how to be safe inside of one. Now, of course, the biggest problem getting these screws out uh, is that they always fall all over the floor. So I'm gonna try to capture them. I think there are three on each side and yeah, some more on the other side. Okay, I'll just uh, jump cut with the back cover off. Alrighty, we're in like Flynn, and I noticed in the back cover, I actually had a little note for myself. So 518 2020, so I guess I've had this for about three years now. Looks like I did a couple mods on this television set. Looks like I removed C720 33 picofarad, and I disconnected the VM from neck. VM, you may ask, what am I talking about? Well, something that happened in the CRT age at the end was something called velocity modulation or scanning velocity modulation where it did this artificial sharpening on the dark to light transitions, I think by slowing down the scanning of the beam or something weird like that, like it would slow it down briefly and then speed it back up again to artificially sharpen the edges to make it look more high resolution or more high definition or whatever. I hate that. Now in some televisions, you can disable that in the menus. Other ones you can disable it in the service menu. But I think on this television, there was no way to disable it. So I started digging around in here and I did not make a video on this, obviously. And I remember I figured out what wire it was uh, on the neck here and I disconnected it. And when I cut that wire, that feature was disabled entirely, which yay, made the picture a lot smoother, a lot more, well, realistic. None of this fake artificial sharpening, which they started doing and I absolutely hate. Now, I don't remember what the capacitor is I removed. I have a feeling it had something to do with the sharpness of the composite video input. It was too soft. And I found that capacitor somewhere along, you know, I don't know, in the input chain here for composite, and I removed it to sharpen the image as well. But unfortunately, other than this note, I didn't write more information, so I don't exactly remember. Now, taking a look inside the CRT here, uh, we can actually see that the picture tube is made by Orion which is one of the last manufacturers of CRTs as far as I'm aware. So while I said this was a Toshiba TV, uh, not really because this is not a Toshiba picture tube. This Orion picture tube made its way into many, many televisions, not Sony's because they always use their own stuff as far as I'm aware at least, but all the other brands that were making CRTs at the end well, Orion was the company. And I think in Thailand, they kept making CRTs well past when they stopped selling them in North America, at least, because there were other markets in the world that still did want CRTs because while they're huge and heavy, they were still cheaper than LCDs, at least for a while. Now, eventually, of course, LCD TVs took the place of every CRT just because they got so inexpensive to manufacture and ship and move and have in your house and all those things that really there was just no reason to keep making these. but. I do know that they did keep going for a while. So if uh, you happen to know the story behind Orion and uh, you can tell a little bit more background info because I'm just talking out of my memory here, uh, definitely let me know. Now, hopefully this is gonna be in focus, but this right here is that scanning velocity modulation junk that I was talking about. So this wire went from something over here on the neck, there's like a little circuit board right there and the coil that goes around the uh, neck here and this connected to this board. It was actually soldered onto here. And I'm pretty sure that coil is what sped up and slowed down the actual sweep to create that artificial sharpness. Now I think it connected to this board, but the signal itself came from the main PCB through these wires here. So I found just cutting this, well that did the trick and I just sort of uh, left this here so it wouldn't be floating around in the television. If you have one of these TVs and you wanna disable that horrible scanning velocity modulation, 
I don't remember where this connected on here exactly, but uh, yeah, just cut that. Now you may be able to tell by the relatively clean appearance of this. I think this set is relatively low hour. I mean, there is a little bit of soot on here. A little bit, I mean, nah, yeah, hardly any actually. Oh yeah, another sub on there. So there's some usage on this television, but it really wasn't much. And I think that's why the picture quality on this thing is really good. It's very bright, vibrant. It's a cheap TV, uh, so it doesn't have the best geometry, especially it changes depending on what you show on the picture. But overall, been very happy with this thing. Now, when we're looking for culprits of what's wrong with this thing, obviously it's going to be something on this bottom board here because yeah, this is obviously the whole power supply and everything for this uh, set. And there's a whole bunch of capacitors on here. So almost certainly one of those is going to be the problem here with this board. So I'm gonna cut some of these zip ties here. In fact, I'm just gonna take this neck board off. I don't wanna risk any kind of damage. It's not glued on or anything, or if it was, I already took the glue off at some point in the past. There we go. It's always a good idea to take this off just because you don't want to accidentally break things, especially if you don't need to run the set. Uh, you don't want to hit this and, and neck the CRT because that would be the end of the line for this thing. It would definitely be for the trash heap at that point. All right, so there is the main PCB. And you know what, I take back everything I said about Toshiba because yeah, while this thing was actually sold by them, I mean, even the chips on here are branded Orion. So clearly this thing was entirely made by Orion and really had nothing to do with Toshiba other than maybe Toshiba spec'd out the features and capability of this set. It does actually have one IC here that is made by Toshiba. It's a TB1253N. I am kind of curious that there are two relatively high pin count ICs on here, what they both do, but this says IF, chroma, and deflection, but it looks like, uh, well, and look, there's some lines on the board. So that is definitely handled by this Toshiba chip. So I guess it's kind of like the jungle IC, although, you know, maybe it's that one. Oh no, that says Micon for this area over here, it's, which is the microcontroller and the thing that handles the remote control and the front buttons and all that kind of stuff. I am noticing, and I know it's out of focus, but there is actually an LED right there. I have my finger on it. It's focusing on this wire here, which is the uh, speaker connector. Um, but anyways, there is an LED right there next to the IR sensor. So I don't know why that doesn't even do anything. Maybe that's a fault indicator that if the set were to experience a problem other than the power supply being bad, which is gonna be over on that section over there, then maybe that would flash to tell you like there's a problem with the deflection or you know shorted windings or whatever the, one of the other issues that these types of sets can automatically detect and you know shut down safely for. Other ICs on this set is this thing right down here, which is an AV switch IC. So the Toshiba IC over here, that one most likely only has one set of inputs. It probably has like an RGB input, component input, S video input, just one of each. So you need something else like a chip here to do all the switching for all of these inputs on the back of the set. This is the tuner, which will send probably composite video directly into that IC as well. This does say IF on it, which is intermediate frequency. So this, this section can probably do the conversion from older style tuners into composite video and then feeds it back through the chip. But almost certainly these modern tuners like this, this would be I squared C or something like that, just sends composite video directly out, you know, into that chip. And then that just switches it, you know, through all these inputs based on the inputs and the controls of the Micon chip, which is that one over there. Now I'm pretty sure on my little note that I said I removed the capacitor, I'm pretty sure that would have been something on the bottom of the board here. There's gonna be a bunch of surface mount components and there is, and I'm quite sure that that's what I ended up removing. And I think I found the IC to remove by looking up the data sheet to this Toshiba jungle IC and figuring out where the softness on the composite video was coming from. And as I mentioned, all of the video is switched through this switcher IC over here and then makes its way to that IC. So I'm quite sure that I found there was some type of video filtering on the composite video from this section to over here and I removed that and it sharpened everything up a lot. In fact, it might have also sharpened up the S video. I don't quite remember and I kind of wish I had made a video about it because then I would be able to talk about it a little more authoritatively. But that was just one of the things I did because I didn't even know if this TV was going to be something I'd keep. So yeah, I did those mods like, like this uh, scanning velocity modulation mod without documenting it. 
All right, let's take a little interlude here while editing. So this is the schematic for the television, which, yes, yeah, spoiler, actually was able to find uh, later on in this video. This IC right here is that AV switcher chip, IC701, and it comes from all the various inputs on the back of the television. It's in YC or as in the luminance signal that's probably used for both S-video and also the component output. Now I had removed a cap that I had written down as C720 and there it is right there C720 33 picofarad and that is the cap that I removed and it looks like very specifically it is on the line one rear input. It seems like that cap only has an effect on that one video input on line one on the rear and line two here uh, also has a 33 picofarad cap this one C 717 and I didn't remove that so this sharpening effect that I that I did by taking this cap away because basically it's connected to ground here uh, I think yeah but going down to ground would have the effect of improving the sharpness but only on that one input and then there's also the AV front inputs which I don't think I did anything with and there's another 33 picofarad capacitor as well so ideally I'd want to remove that capacitor from all of the video inputs if you want to improve the sharpness. But I guess for whatever reason, I only felt I wanted to do it on one of them and leave the other two as is. So if I was gonna plug in something that was high resolution with a composite video, like say the Apple II, I should definitely plug it into the rear input one, and then two and three are gonna be unaffected. A problem that can come up by removing the softening or the notch filtering from the inputs is that it can create more visible dot crawl on color video. And that unfortunately is the way NTSC video works because the dot pattern, which is how the color is encoded, is overlaid on top of the luminance signal and it can be distracting. So normally TVs will filter that out, which is what this capacitor here is all about, all three of these. One thing I didn't mention about this set is it also has a comb filter. A comb filter is a later development for NTSC video to help eliminate the dot crawl. And it uses some temporal time filtering averaging or something like that to try to remove any of those NTSC artifacts you're getting. So the video signal comes in, it actually just taps right into the composite video signal that comes off the switcher IC here. And then what comes out of the comb filter is like an S video signal, YC or luminance and chrominance. And that feeds back into this chip here, which I think allows the set to select that. Seems to indicate that it is selectable whether you have the comb filter on or off. I don't recall seeing anything in the service menu or in any of the menus about that. So I don't really know if the comb filter is enabled all the time, or maybe sometimes it is and sometimes it's not. But I just wanted to mention that this is something that this set does have. All right, well, to the problem at hand, it's going to be over in this area for sure. Now there aren't a whole lot of caps, but this is definitely the switch mode power supply that this set utilizes to power up the entire set. This is the mains input coming in right here. And of course, yes, the set is unplugged right now. This wire here goes to the degaussing coil. There's a couple resistors here, or might be a thermistor that is handling that. Other things of note, there's a B plus adjustment, which I'm not gonna touch. I don't know what the B plus of this set is, but that has to do with the output voltage from this entire switch mode power supply. This right here is just a choke. So that's a filtering that comes in for the mains. This is the power transformer that's almost certainly switched by whatever's on this heat sink right here, which will be some type of a transistor driven by a driver that's probably on the backside of the board. I doubt there's anything wrong with this particular section. Something is wrong over here and see these capacitors that are all right here? Well, these are the output filters. And I'm noticing on here that these caps here, which you won't be able to see very well, are Rubicon brand. So they're not even junk. That's kind of shocking. Now, I actually believe that the standby power supply on this set is working because when I went to go use it, it was actually plugged in and just turned off. And I pushed the power button and the TV responded to that command and tried to turn on and then it just started doing the clicking and not starting. And the microcontroller pretty much saves the last state of the televisions. That way, if you turn it off with a remote power switch, it will always kind of turn back on on its own. You don't have to push the button on the remote. That's the way this set works, at least. Now, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look around for any obvious signs of leakage or bulging caps. These Rubicon caps here, mm, I don't see anything out of the ordinary at all. They all look absolutely fine. And these ones back here, same thing. 
Maybe that one. No, that one looks okay as well. Incidentally, looking at these caps over here, and this is gonna be for like the vertical and the horizontal output and stuff. I don't think this stuff is gonna be problematic. Those are Nichicon caps there. And I see some more Rubicons back here. And what about these over here? I think this is a Nichicon as well. I'm actually shocked. This set is specced with pretty good quality caps. Maybe that had something to do with Toshiba there, giving their input into uh, the construction of this set. So I think what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna pop this board out here and I'm gonna tilt this up so I can work on the bottom and I can get my capacitor tester and I'm just gonna check these caps. Cause really, even though they're good brands, by the 2000s, everything was kind of made really crappily and uh, it's just worth checking these. The board is up in service position and before I use my capacitor tester to check the caps, because I actually had this thing plugged in and we did try to turn it on, it wasn't that long ago, I'm gonna use the multimeter here. I'm just gonna check for any voltages that are lingering around on the caps. And this actually has a high Z mode on it, this, uh, or low Z, which is like low resistance. And that's a great mode for uh, draining any of these caps of any residual voltage that they may have. All right, so this is the main filter cap. So this would be charged to like, two, you know, 200 volts or so. And it is currently at 4.6, so almost nothing. Let's put that on low Z here and see what this measures as zero there. When we go back, what do we see now? See, 1.4, it actually drained it quite a bit. So I'm just gonna drain that the rest of the way. Although uh, the switching power supply is not gonna operate Therefore, there shouldn't be any kind of voltage floating around, at least on, uh, you know, things to get shocked. 0.17 volt now is what we're getting there. So the nice thing about what Orion did, I guess, when they made this is it keeps falling over. I need to stick a mouse pad under it or something to keep it from sliding. Let's put that there. Uh, the nice thing they did is they marked the PCB. So there are markings and they're a little hard to see because they're black but the silk screen markings are all over the board here. And it gives you an idea of, um, well, you know, where the capacitors and where the various components are. But what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna check to make sure there is absolutely no voltage on these caps here. And there isn't, and that's just because, like I said, I don't wanna go just randomly connecting up my other device. Now there is a little bit of like crust and stuff down here. I think that is leftover from when the TV was rained on. All right, so I have my meter here in ESR mode, capacitance mode, and I'm just gonna start going through this and figuring out if any of them look unusual. And it's a little bit of a trick. You gotta kind of look uh, at the back side of the board to see the value, check that. But it's kind of obvious if you hit an electrolytic and it has a value of like in the picofarads or something, you know that there's something wrong or nanofarads even. Okay, so I've been testing the caps here and I switched over to my very sharp probes because they can cut right through that oxidation. I've been testing the caps all the way on this uh, power supply section. Now the transformer is right here. So high voltage sides over here, which I don't think there's a problem with low voltage sides over here, where I think the issue exists. Now I've tested that cap, that cap, that cap, that cap. They all look good. These are the big caps. But uh, this cap right here, there's a plus right there. It's right above the word power here. If I dig in there, we are getting three picofarads. It appears that cap is open, at least in circuit here. So the best thing to do now is remove that part and let's see how it measures out of circuit. There's the cap, Rubicon, 2200 microfarad. Is it really possible that there's something wrong with this cap or was I just not measuring it properly? Let's try to measure it in this meter directly here. Yeah, so I don't understand why I wasn't getting a good reading uh, in the board. I mean, certainly the cap does not look like it's leaked or anything like that. I mean, weight wise, I, I don't know, it seems fine. And let's just pop it back in there and there it is. It's reading perfectly. Uh, I'm running at 100 hertz here. If we move this up to, t uh, let's move up to one kilohertz. So 1800 microfarad, 0.02 ohms ESR, yeah, it's practically nothing. 35 volt cap, I mean, that's uh, that's fine. So it's definitely confusing because I was reading right off that point and I was getting nothing on the meter there. All right, well, I think I need to pop this back in the board. 
You know, I wonder, I wonder if there's a short right here. I wonder if that's what's happening actually, because I can't remember with my meter what happens when there is a short. So I'm gonna break out the multimeter here, because it's quite possible that when there's a short right across that cap, then my meter will read something like, you know, whatever picofarad. And that's why we were getting that fake value. So let's make sure that's reading. There we go. Let's see what this is doing. Oh, look at that. Oh, no, that's not a short. That's just a charging cap. Try it the other way. Same thing happened. So it charged up a cap. Okay, so, uh, yeah. Beeps for a little bit, then it goes away. Now the cap is out of the board, and if I read this for capacitance using this meter, see if we get anything out of this. Maybe other caps. 431 microfarad across where there's no cap even installed. So this obviously is in parallel with some other caps somewhere else. Again, the weird thing was, is why when that cap was in there, was I getting picofarads? All right, I'm gonna reinstall this cap. I really don't think there's anything wrong with it. Let's get this back in the board. Okay, the cap is back in, the original cap. And now it's reading without issue, there it is. 2.36 microfarad. Now we know there's some extra capacitance on that rail because we were reading it with a cap out of the board. Why was it not reading? I mean, I don't know what I was doing. I guess I was just getting oxidation. Yeah, because that's that's reading perfectly now. All right, so now I can uh, draw a mark on there just to say that I have tested that cap and it is good. So that cap's good, that cap's good, that cap is good, that one and that one. Now there are some more caps right over here and I tested that one and it's good. Uh, that's not uh, electrolytic. I'm just gonna quickly look for any others and then test those. All right, so I popped this little tiny capacitor out of the board. You can, you'll be able, to be able to see it. It's a 10 microfarad, 16 volt. It is a Nichicon. And when I measure it, let me do it right now. It's a little tricky. The capacitance measures fine, but the ESR is really high. It's 10 microfarad. Well, the ESR is sort of all over the place. Now it's 13, but a little while ago it was 100 ohms. That seems too high uh, for a 16 volt cap. Hopefully you can see that. Um, so I happen to have a roll here of 10 microfarad. Uh, these are 25 volts and these are ceramics. And I'm going to take one of these out of here and we'll measure it. And we will pop it onto the bottom of the board just to see how it works. Because it could be, let's measure this one. <laughs> if I can, I'm gonna try to measure the ESR here on this little thing. Whoa, whoa, it keeps flying out. Let's try this again. Three ohms, 10 microfarad. So that's more like I would expect. So I'm gonna just install it on the bottom of the board and I see that there's a bunch of these caps all around the board. Uh, there's more of those and maybe uh, they're sort of a blue color they look different than the rest of the caps on here, and maybe these have failed. Now, the funny thing is, I would be installing a normal electrolytic if I could, but I don't happen to have any uh, that are the right value, even though this is like a super common value. Nice thing about these ceramic caps is they are not polarized. Alrighty, let's see what we get here now for this little cap. 10 microfarad and Honestly, it's, uh, it's now 0 0.07 over on D value. <laughs> okay, there we go. Now we're back on ESR. Let's try that again. Yeah, 10 microfarad at 0.7 ohms. That's a lot better. So I think I'm gonna go look around for more of these little tiny 10 microfarad caps, and I'm just gonna do the same swap on the bottom of the board, and hopefully that does the trick. All right, I went ahead and I replaced a few more of the, these little caps. I'm not feeling super confident that I actually fixed the issue though, because they all had like decent capacitance, uh, microfarads matched what was on the label. The ESR just seemed a little higher than normal. And you know, high ESR on caps, especially the small ones, isn't necessarily a bad thing. Like it doesn't always result in a TV that's not working. So I think at this point, I'm going to power this thing up while the PCB is out of the set. So everything is reconnected right now. Now it's just uh, resting here. It's not plugged into mains yet because as soon as I plug it in, it will turn itself on because that's the last state the microcontroller was in. But I think when this thing is trying to start up, I can start checking the voltage on these caps over here on the power supply just so we can see if 
well, they all look like they're normal. And then if we start seeing one dropping really low uh, when the set tries to start, then maybe there's a short or something like that on the board. So I think that's the next course of action. So I know you can't see the front of the set, but I'm going to uh, plug it into the isolation transformer, which is down here on the floor. And here we go. Let's see what happens. Okay. So there we go, it's doing the clicking. Uh, I heard the power supply uh, start up initially, like the standby voltage, I guess. And now the relays are clicking, which are trying to start the whole set. All righty, so let's see here. So like this capacitor right here, for instance, uh, we got 18.1 volts. It's not changing either. Uh, but this one here. 116 volts, and it's also not changing, even though the set's constantly trying to restart. So that's probably B plus the uh, 111 volts. There's 111 volts again, and now it looks stable. It does sort of drop. Oh, the set just turned itself on. <laughs> well, that is interesting. And that gave me a little bit of a start <laughs> when it happened. Let's measure that cap here that I was on. Now that the set is running, 111 volts, that would be the B plus. And this one here, same thing. And this is the cap we took out and put back in the board, 15.9 volts. And then there's this cap right up here, 8.88 volts. And I don't know what's correct or what not, what's not correct, it's not labeled on here. And here's 12.26. I mean, this thing is running now. I'm gonna grab this remote and we're gonna turn it off. Uh, and incidentally, there is a power LED on the on the board. I could actually see it lit. Uh, that was the, the LED I was pointing to earlier. It's not a fault indicator. It is actually uh, a power LED. It's just very dim. And I think it's really set far back, so you wouldn't see it. All right, um, let me turn this off. Okay, set is off now. And let's measure some of these voltages. I have a feeling this power supply actually runs all the time. It like generates all the voltages of this switching power supply. Yeah, 116 volts. 116, 17.1, that was a bit uh, lower when the set was running. Nine volts there and 12.8 there. Hmm. So down here on one of the caps that I actually changed, it's at 4.85 volts. You know, that could be something to do with the power supply uh, for the microcontroller. And how about this one here? This one's at 5.6 volts. I mean, again, I'm just like, I have no idea what things should be. And here's another one that I swapped. That one's at nine volts. All right, well, I'm gonna grab the remote here and let's turn this back on. Let's see if it just goes back into clicky click mode. Yep, it is exactly doing that. Oh, but it took only one click to actually start that time. Yeah, the set is running right now. So these relays, where are these relays? These relays are down in this area right here. What? Maybe there's just something wrong with the circuit that actually drives the relay. So the microcontroller, when you send the on signal, instructs the relay to turn on, which I think is connecting that B plus voltage, that 100 and whatever volts, to the rest of the set. I'm gonna turn this TV back off. Now, interesting is it didn't click when I turned it off. So the relay may only be for controlling the degaussing and nothing else, because that's kind of typical on sets. To be power efficient, the degaussing is energized, and then when, you know, after a little while, it clicks off uh, to essentially say that, you know, you're done degaussing. It doesn't keep trying to degauss, which wastes energy. I'm gonna turn it on, I'm gonna listen. I've never even paid attention. I'm gonna listen for the relay and hear if it clicks off after a little while once the TV starts. Okay, so now we're having the starting problem, of course. There we go, the set started. And then it clicked off. Okay, so the relay is definitely, um, the relay definitely has to do with the degaussing and the fact that it's clicking over and over again is something else. The microcontroller is trying to start the entire set and I think it controls the relay. So it's restarting. So maybe it's the power supply, the power supply on the microcontroller, it's just gotta be that issue. It's gotta be that chip that's having a problem. So I think a good starting point is to just look through the voltages that we get on the microcontroller here. Just gonna go through all the pins on here and I'm gonna look for stuff that looks like it is power supply related. 
All right, 5.97, let's hit the power button on this remote. No, oh, it's pretty stable. And when the set is running, it's at 4.74 volts. So it drops a little bit and let's turn it off. And there it goes back up to uh, 4.97. I guess the weird thing here is that the set absolutely was not starting. I, it was clicking away, oh, I don't know, for like 10 minutes and it never started, and now it clicks once and then starts. And I'm just confirming here that the relay is energized at 12 volts uh, by the microcontroller, I guess. Well, I mean, I haven't traced it out back to the microcontroller, but I'm sure that's what's going on. But every time I turn the set off and on now, it always starts after one kind of cycle, one click of the relay. I don't think that's right. I think it should start on the very first try, Alrighty, so I wasn't really getting anywhere on the PCB, so I came back to the bench and I did a quick Google for the part number and the service manual, and look what came up. Now, I know for sure when I got this TV back in 2020, this service manual wasn't available, and that's because when I look in the folder uh, that I have for this TV, I have like a folder on my Google Drive, I have the service manual for the 25-inch version, which has a slightly different part number, but I, I found that it was similar. And that's how I figured out how to disable the velocity modulation on the neck board there by looking in the 25 inch one. But now there's the actual service manual for this exact TV. And I think hopefully this is gonna point us in exactly the right direction. It's kind of one of the reasons why right to repair is so important because I'm not super experienced in fixing TVs, especially these modern ones like this. Uh, obviously if you are a repair person, you probably would know exactly where to look for these types of issues, but me, no, not so much. So the schematics really help a lot. Now, I kind of talked about this earlier when I was poking around on the motherboard, but I think the problem, well, I think the thing that we need to focus on is the microcontroller that runs the TV. The power supply appears to be working fine. All those caps are good. The voltages are there and everything. And in fact, uh, higher up in this manual, it tells you what the B plus voltage is and 111 volts is what it is, and it's exactly what it was on the TV. Now, the first thing to notice is that ground and VCC are down at one end of the chip, and let me just quickly check that now. Now, of course, the camera is there, and uh, I'm not recording at the same time, so I'm just gonna go check that five volts, make sure that's what I'm getting on that chip. Alrighty, and yes, I'm getting about 4.96 volts on the five volt pin, uh, it's 27 right here, so that is good. Now, I spent a little bit of time examining the schematics here just to try to figure out how this works exactly. Now, there are two outputs from this IC that are relevant here. There's the degauss circuit right here, or the degauss signal. I think H maybe means goes high to degauss the set. And there's also pin 41 right here, which is the power output. Now, 41, if we trace this, it goes right off the board over, well, it goes to a different section of the board over to the power part or the power supply on this TV. Now that particular signal from or to the MICOM board here. So we are looking, there's the degauss signal. We'll look at that in a second. This is the power signal right here. So this comes down and it goes over here to this transistor, which when it's turned on by the microcontroller turns on this transistor here, which is the 12 volts, the main 12 volts, that then goes to a bunch of other things. So this goes up here to this transistor, which gets turned on. It also turns on this regulator here, a nine volt regulator. And it also turns on this five volt regulator. And all of these things leave the power section of the board here, uh, right here, like PCON nine volts, PCON five volts. It's basically those voltages when the set is turned on that goes to other areas of the board, like the deflection circuitry, which then fires up the whole deflection circuit, which of course is how the set generates the high voltage through the flyback transformer. Going back to this degaussing signal right here, which also comes from the microcontroller, that goes up here. Unfortunately, it's a little tricky to trace it all or follow it, but I've done this. And there it is right there, relay drive. It goes to this transistor right here, which activates this relay, which connects the degaussing coil to the mains, directly to the mains. Oh, and through a thermistor, which is uh, that part right there. So it's kind of exactly like I thought. Now, since I've analyzed this circuit, I took the multimeter and I took a look at those two output signals that are coming from the microcontroller the degauss signal and the power output signal. And when I first turn on the set and it does that click click, I'm actually seeing a pulse coming out of pin 41 for the power and also the degauss circuit. So the microcontroller does try to start for a second and then it stops. 
So it's the microcontroller itself that is actually stopping the power on sequence. And um, well, the set earlier was just starting up after like one click, and I could see that this power signal would stay high. And the reason why it says 5.0 volts is I think all the voltage readings that are on this schematic are when the set is operating. But the degauss circuit output here is zero volts because the degauss only stays on for a few seconds and then it clicks off. So why exactly is the microcontroller turning on the set and then immediately turning off the set? Well, there's a couple possibilities that, I mean, I haven't figured this out yet, but I think this is gonna be the problem. The five volt rail here, it seems to have some local capacitance, so 470 microfarad at 6.3 volts. I don't know for sure if I've tested that cap, but I'm pretty sure I have, and I, you know, all the caps seem to be good on this set anyways, so I don't think that's the problem. There's a couple other inputs to the microcontroller. There's one called P fail, and there's one called X ray. I think the P fail is something to do with the comparator on the power supply circuit. I went and took a look at that, that page. And if something is out of spec or not working properly on the power supply, I think it asserts that P fail signal, like the power supply has failed, which will tell the microcontroller to shut everything down. Also, there's an X ray input here too. And I'm pretty sure that has the effect of turning off the whole TV in case something's wrong like this, too much high voltage coming out of the flyback, which could start to generate x-rays. There's a circuit in the TV that should like shut the whole thing off. And if we scroll over here, this comes from the deflection circuit, the x-ray input, which is understandable. It's exactly what you would think. And there's also an emergency thing here on the power board, which I'm thinking is also something to do with some powers way out of spec or something. And when that gets turned on, that has the effect of giving five volts to the x-ray input right here. And that should shut down everything. Now, while the set is operating, it does say that that input should be at zero volts. And I did start up the set and I noticed that that input was more than zero volts. It was like around two volts or one point something volts. Thing is, I'm not 100% sure what this should look like because it does start. And like I said, the, the set was actually running normally. And while it was clicking on to try to start, I didn't see five volts or anything, you know, pulsing on this pin. It just was sitting around zero volts. It was only once the whole set started that then I started seeing like two volts or so on there. Now, there's another possibility. Take a look at this. I noticed this. So there's a reset pin right here. And it says five volts. Like any computer or microcontroller, you need a reset circuit to actually get the thing uh, to come out of reset gracefully, like once the power supplies have started. Now on a computer, reset is handled by something like a 505 timer or a little circuit that just, you know, waits a little bit of time before it comes out of reset. But I'm wondering if whatever's controlling the reset is continually resetting the microcontroller. So what I probably need to do is get onto it on pin 30 there. I'm just gonna write that down on a note so we can go over there with the oscilloscope and take a look at pin 30 because we should look at what that's doing. And the reason why, and I'll scroll over here now, is if we go over here, this reset actually comes from this little IC here, a PST600C. And I have the data sheet here for it. And the PST600 is from Mitsumi. And it's a little IC designed to create a reset signal. But one of the things it does, it doesn't just like wait for power to become good before it lets the processor start, but it seems to also check the power supply voltage and maybe if it detects a kind of glitch or whatever on the power supply, it will reset the microcontroller. And maybe that's what's happening. When the microcontroller goes to start everything, there's gonna be a bit of a drawdown on the power supply and maybe this IC here is saying, uh oh, something's the matter here. And it's actually resetting uh, the entire circuit. So it looks like there are versions of this chip here. See, there's a C, D, E, F, G, whatever, all the way there. Does it have a, a letter here? Oh, it has C. Okay, so 4.5 volts. So I think it's trying to say here that if the voltage drops below 4.5 volts, it's gonna reset the microcontroller. Okay, so here's some characteristics, and it happens to be of the C version, which is the one that we actually have in here. So what it's saying here is that if the voltage is below like four point whatever, it's gonna hold the output around zero volts. And just like most microcontrollers or CPUs for that matter, they're always reset when the reset signal is held around ground. And that's what's happening here. And once it crosses that threshold of four point whatever, it comes out a reset. 
Now the thing is, we need to look at that with the scope. Like I said, I wrote this down on here, pin 30, because what if, I don't know, uh, let's go back to the other schematic. You know, there's some caps and stuff here. Look at this, a 50 volt, one microfarad cap. Maybe that cap is bad. Now this is gonna be ground down here, but this up here is gonna be five volts. And if we, yeah, it's gonna be the same VCC rail that the actual microcontroller is getting as well. So probably what I need to do is put the oscilloscope onto uh, this pin 27 here. Look at the five volts when we try to turn on the set and see if we're seeing a dip. And then we can also just look at pin 30 here, which is the reset line to try to see if it's actually resetting the microcontroller. And it's quite possible that the microcontroller, once it comes out of reset, it may not actually try to start the set for a good number of seconds. Like, you know how we're hearing it click, click. It's like every several seconds. It could be that the microcontroller just waits. That's normal operation for it. So yeah, I think the best lead I have right now is this reset input. As I said, I think this cap right here could be the issue. Maybe we just need to put a little bit more capacitance on there or something like that, just to uh, make sure that this uh, little reset IC has some clean power. Alrighty, so I have the oscilloscope, which you probably can't see very well. How about that? That's a bit better. It is on the five volt rail here on the chip. Now the TV's unplugged right now, so I'm gonna go plug it in. Unfortunately, gotta squeeze by the camera here. Plug that in, there it is. You can see the sag as it tries to start. Does it, it catches it sometimes, there it is. So it definitely is sagging there. So one thing I'm gonna try to do is add some additional capacitance. Oh, you know what, maybe we should go look at that other circuit. I'm gonna unplug this. But I'm wondering if that is triggering the reset. So reset was on pin 30 and the set is off. So when I plug this in, we should see this drop down. Is that even in focus? Doesn't look like it's in focus. We should see it jump up to five volts and it's on normal trigger mode. So we should see it go to five, but if it's dropping down because it's resetting the microcontroller, we should see that on here. Okay, look at that. Did you see that? Can we catch it again? No. Nope. There was a reset. And then it came out. Oh, there it is. That's a reset right there. Let's go to trigger and we'll switch this to single. There it is, right there. <laughs> that is the, the reset chip resetting the microcontroller. That, right there, that's gotta be the problem. There's gotta be an issue around the power, around that little reset IC, and it's causing the whole TV to not start. So this is the reset IC, and there's C111, and I did not change it. This is a one microfarad cap. Now I'm not gonna immediately think that that cap is the problem. And the reason why is because we also saw that sagging going on on the entire power supply. That basically means that the reset circuit might be doing its job. I just gotta switch this into the mode. Everyone likes to see ESR, there it is. So that's the cap right there. 1.6 microfarad at six ohms, 6.8 ohms. So it's not terrible to be honest. I'm not sure that that value is actually a problem. It's a 50 volt cap and I think that's why the ESR is a little bit high. And I was reading at one kilohertz. So the value was a little higher than I expected to be honest, but there are some little bypass caps, these two reddish color caps. There's a cap that supplies that that entire five volt rail to this that we saw sagging as well. I'm gonna just bodge in another capacitor, like a higher value one or another one onto that um, entire circuit. And let's see if that makes a difference. The cap in question that supplies the bulk capacitance to the microcontroller is C118, which appears to be this one right here. Yeah, 6.3 volts, 470 microfarads. So let's just measure it. I can do it from the top side here. You know, 400 microfarads kind of fluctuating, but I don't have great contact. That seems fine. That really doesn't seem super problematic, but why don't I just bodge in another cap and let's see if that makes any difference. I have a 1000 microfarad 16 volt cap here. I'm just gonna bodge that onto the backside of the board. <laughs> okay, it's bodged on. Now if we measure this cap, we should see a much higher value. Yeah, there it is, 1300, okay. Let's see, let's see if that makes a difference. I'm gonna plug in the set. Uh, maybe I'll get the scope hooked up, actually. Let's hook up the scope. 
Yes, let's hook up the scope. All right, the scope is hooked up. It's in single shot mode, it's waiting. Let's turn on the set and see what happens. And it just started right up. Just like that. No clickety clickety. <laughs> it just started. Let's turn it off. Okay, it's off now. Um, so if I put this back in single shot mode, there we go. There was a little bit of a sag there. Actually, a little spike as well, but the set just started right up. So I guess, like, okay, I gotta move this out of the way. <laughs> it's a little close to the high voltageness of the of the set there. I think it was the sag. It was the sag on the five volt rail going to the microcontroller that was causing that reset chip to trip. So I guess what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take out that uh, cap that's on there, the one that's on the board that's like 470 microfarad. I'm just gonna replace it with that, that 1000 microfarad that I have bodged on the back. I don't need to have them both there. But yeah, this is an interesting problem. I mean, I don't really get it because why is there sag? I don't know, but there is, we saw it, 470 microfarad. So yeah, I'm gonna put this 1000 on here. Well, to be honest, I don't know. This looks like a fakey, like a Nichicon fake. I'm gonna put a real one on because <laughs> I have the real deal, 1016 volts, and these are good quality caps. Not the unknown one I had uh, from my little parts bin. That's what I grabbed, that other one that I bodged in. But yeah, there it is. It's another Rubicon. The one I'm putting in is a PX series, and the one I took out is the YK series, whatever that means. Incidentally, the footprint on the board is actually designed for this larger cap. This smaller cap, the legs had to be spread apart and it was sort of hanging off the board a little bit. So I'm wondering if this was the original size and they kind of went down a notch for whatever reason, cost savings maybe. All right, there's the new cap in the board and I haven't cropped the legs off yet so I could just uh, connect the oscilloscope right on the legs so we can monitor the sag. Now let's hit the power button on the remote. Okay, it triggered, oh yeah, cool. And the TV start right up. Much better. Remember what it looked like before? I guess I'll insert a picture or something like that. But with the old cap in there, had much more of a sag than that. And the TV, well, it's just running. It just started right up. No clickety clickety. I think this was it. This was the bad part. Let's use the ESR meter with it out of circuit here. 377 microfarad. 0.48, it seems okay. I mean, it's a little low, I guess, the value. It should be 470, so it's about 100 low. So I guess that caused the issue. I mean, that's close enough. I would have thought it'd be okay, but I guess not. Alrighty, the TV is all back together. Uh, let's turn this on. Just turns right on. We have the red LED. You know, I think the red light was there the whole time. The problem is if I'm standing up I can't see it because it's at the top of this little window here. Either way, uh, there's the VCR. Let's pop in my tape here. Create a voltage divider, which is also part um, of the combination of the Are you kidding me? This RCA cable here comes from. <laughs> what the heck? I think this VCR broke. <laughs> it's my um, Panasonic Super VHS. We have audio, but we have no video. Oh no, I can't believe this thing is broken too. Uh, the audio we're hearing is most likely the audio uh, from the, the linear track, not hi-fi. So the head stopped working? I mean, I've never had problems with this VCR. It's always just worked. So yeah, okay. Well, that's disappointing. We want to at least see a picture. I mean, we were seeing a blue screen, but we want to see this thing working, right? All righty, let's see what's going on here. Let's put that tape in there. I mean, it's threading it around the head normally. Okay, I'm getting absolutely... Okay, let's turn this volume down. This is my own tape, of course. I don't know what's happening here. And that makes it do stuff. See what happens if I put tension on the tape here. That doesn't change anything at all. I'm gonna clean the heads, I guess. All right, for cleaning the heads, I'm gonna use a piece of paper here. The head spins counterclockwise. So I'll put some 99% IPA here on a piece of paper. And I'm just gonna put this against the head. And I'm gonna turn this the direction that it normally turns, which is counterclockwise. I can feel the heads underneath the uh, paper. And yeah, there's a little bit of crap on there. Let's get the rest of the drum. 
Basically, the uh, paper's slightly abrasive, but the IPA in there, and it just gets everything off the heads. That shouldn't be on there. Yeah, definitely some junk on there. Maybe I have a tape that I was playing that sort of shed magnetic material onto the heads. Still coming off on there. It's better now, but it definitely was dirty there. All right, let's see if that made a difference. Uh, look at that. That was it. I guess the heads were just like clogged up with magnetic material or something. <laughs> I mean, I thought this VCR was broken, but it was just dirty heads. I mean, last time I used it, I didn't have any problems with it. There it is. This is the same tape we were just playing and uh, well, it wasn't working. And now, now it's working. Okay, let's put this stuff back together again so I can properly demonstrate the TV actually working. Alrighty, try number two. So turn on the TV, it starts right up. We have a red light there. I don't exactly see it if I'm sitting at this angle like here because I'm a little bit above it. So I think that light was always there and I just never noticed it. We have the VCR working. I got some of my Adrian's Digital Basement videos here. Pop that in. Auto plays because I have the Right Protect tab out. And look, there we go. It's working. I'm working on the Panasonic TV there. Oops, that's not the button I wanted to push. <laughs> uh, let's see. Toshiba Television input. Oh, there we go. Yeah, there's a bunch of different inputs on this TV, but video one is the S video input on the back. I was going to turn up the volume here. About two volts above ground. There it is. Sound is working. Here, there's where I cut. And what's interesting about this set, if we go into the menu here, uh, notice I have the contrast and the brightness quite low. This TV is so bright, even though it's definitely been used, so there's a little bit of that soot inside. Normal bright viewing image for like down here in the basement, even though I have all the lights on, oh, that went away, um, is 29 and 30. And I don't know if it's exactly calibrated because I will adjust it periodically if I'm hooking up a different computer and stuff. Very bright CRT. It's kind of why I like this thing because it just works pretty well. Uh, what else do we have in here? Um, I don't know, some V-chip garbage and stuff like that. Tuner, I don't know, whatever, I don't use it. And then, yeah, bass treble and BBE, whatever that is. I think it's like bass ex extension or boomy bass expansion or <laughs> something like that. I don't know. Um, I don't actually don't know how to exit the menu. Hmm. Uh, nope. Nope. All right, there we are. I just let it time out. I, I don't know. I think there's an exit button. I don't know which one I programmed it onto. I have the original remote still. I just put it away because, uh, well, the batteries, I don't want it to leak and stuff. And I have rechargeables in here, nickel metal hydrides. These old Harmony remotes are great because this supports multiple devices, including this TV, the VCR DVD player, a Sony, I have Sony TVs programmed into here, plus my little uh, small nine inch color CRT I use down in the basement sometimes. It's all with this one remote. It's very handy. Anyhow, it's nice to see this set working again. And uh, yeah, we can turn it off and we can turn it back on. One push and it comes right back. There it is. Ha <laughs> ha, yes. Pretty awesome, right? So yeah, the TV is fixed. I'm pretty excited that it's working again. I figured I'd be able to get it working. And at the beginning of the video, I said it was gonna be caps. But once I saw there were Rubicons and some Nichicons in there, I really didn't think that it was actually gonna be a cap problem, especially because using the ESR meter, everything looked pretty much fine. But I'm really glad I decided to go look for the schematic and I found the schematic for the TV, which allowed me to, after a little bit of studying, figure out that it was the reset circuit all along. And then using the oscilloscope, we were able to verify right there on the scope that voltage sag was happening on that five volt rail going to the microcontroller that was causing it to get stuck in reset. So a little bit more capacitance on there, and there you go. My guess is that original 470 microfarad cap that was on there, since it lost about 100 microfarad of value, went from 470 down to about 370, that that was enough to kind of push it over the edge. So I just gave it a little bit more extra juice there with that 1000 microfarad, and hopefully that should be just fine. So I hope you enjoyed this video, a little bit of troubleshooting on something that, well, it was built in the 2000s, 2001, I have to say, it's probably the newest television that I've ever fixed or newest CRT that I've ever fixed. So there you go. And then, oh yeah, the VCR decided to, you know, give up the ghost as well. But that turned out to just be clogged heads and was an easy fix. 
big shout out to 12 volt vids. If you want to know all about fixing VCRs and pretty much everything else, uh, his channel is really good. I'll link it down below. Uh, I learned that trick with the paper and cleaning the heads from him. And he used to be a Sony tech repaired who knows how many VCRs and camcorders and whatever for Sony electronics. And uh, that was the method they used apparently. So if it's good enough for Sony, it's good enough for me. So comment down below if you have any thoughts about this video. Uh, thumbs up if you liked it. If you didn't, you know what to do. All the usual YouTube stuff, subscribe, et cetera, et cetera. And a huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. Patrons get early access to videos and behind the scenes, stuff like that. In fact, I'm really going to be doing a live stream very soon. In fact, maybe I'll do it in the morning. I'll just like start an impromptu one and see who shows up. I don't know. No, I should probably announce it first if I do that. Anyways, okay, I'm rambling. Thanks very much for watching. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye.